Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And I'd like to say particular thank to the support staff. Everybody says hello. Everything is so nicely organized in the accommodation hall and here in this building as well. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, the talk is uh, about optical frequency comps in microresonators, and the uh, particular focus will be on microresonators with second order nonlinearity, as opposite to the third one. Right, this is a little group that worked on this, and the primary funding came from the from the from Brussels. <clears throat> so these are the couple of images of systems uh, I'm going to talk about two examples of microresonators. This is a glass sphere, right? And this is a, a optical mode, light propagating along the circumference. It's a whispering gallery type of uh, mode that you can see here. Typical size here is five millimeters, right? <clears throat> and this is an integrated version of this. You can make those on tip of a fiber. So it's a Macroscopic object as this one, but this one is much smaller. You can see the uh, 50, 50 microns. This ring is uh, on the on the photonic chip, right? Can be made from different um, different uh, semiconductor materials, typically, right? And I put here some numbers, right, which uh, we call finest. For this, it, the finest is very high, is uh, one million. And for this reason, it is the finest can be between 1,000 and 10,000. And I best explain what is finest using this example, a uh, very well-known example of whispering gallery modes in St. Paul Cathedral. So you send your, your whisper around the circumference of the cathedral. You hear yourself once or at best twice. So it, this is the finest of St. Paul Cathedral. One or two, right? And after this, the energy of the wave is dissipated. So in our case, if you flashlight and to resonate it, there is no pump, there is no gain. So it uh, circulates there for thousands or in some cases for millions of round trips, right? So we work with very high finest systems, <clears throat> right? Uh, here are some example of a spectrum you can generate here, right? Uh, this is a relatively small system and uh, with relatively small number of modes compared to the fiber lasers. So the real, relevant number of modes is say from 1,000 to maybe 10,000, 50,000 modes in these systems. And they need to be pumped, right? In order to sustain uh, the uh, operation state. So CW pump comes through the waveguide into this ring or spherical resonator, right? And what is generated inside can be a train of pulse. This is your desired state, right? Either one or several regularly located pulses inside the ring. And uh, at the output, you have a regular train of pulses. This is a mod log state of this, of this, uh, of the things. And boundary conditions outputs, critical and spectrum. Spectrum is, discreteness of the spectrum is, uh, is very important. Applications are uh, numerous potential ones, and uh, there are many uh, sort of companies interested in this uh, technology, and uh, this spectra can be used uh, in uh, astronomical measurements, in particular for discovery of the exoplanets. Uh, the fact that repetition rate of these pulses is much slower than the optical frequency, and typically it's hundreds of gigahertz, uh, these devices provide a nice uh, sort of bridge between the optics and electronics, and this is used for optical processing of information. This is just two examples out of many they used like in LIDARs and, and, other, and other things, spectroscopy, uh, different precision measurements. <clears throat> so this is the schematics of what I'm going to talk about. So this is a nonlinear uh, polarization. Uh, I am involved with, so there is a linear part and there is a nonlinear. So the nonlinear is a second order uh, nonlinearity, which is proportional to the field squared, not to the field cubed, right? I assume that you come with a monochromatic light and there is a resonator, right? Made in our case, it's a monolithic, it's all together made from K2, uh, material with K2 nonlinearity, right? And what you have at the output, you have the pump frequency, but the pump spectrum is broadened with many lines. So there is a comb of lines around pump 
And there is a comb of lines around second harmonic, right? In case of second harmonic generation. And there can be parametric down conversion when you come with omega p. I always use this red and green, and you down convert. So you have a comb generated around your pump and the comb generated around the half frequency. This is half harmonic generation or optical parametrical uh, oscillator arrangement, <clears throat> right? And that's how the comb looks. So there is a red comb and there is a green comb. So this is a, a two color, two color combs I'm going to uh, describe. And these are the types of the micro resonators that we have modeled. They've been fabricated in a, a Freiburg in Germany. <clears throat> there are different crystals and actually plenty, dozens of uh, crystals with a um, non-zero chi-2, which lacks a center of symmetry. And you can, you can cut the things out of these crystals, polish them, make very high quality to achieve this very high finesses, right? Finesses in our devices sort of uh, 10,000, right? And the separation between modes, which is called free spectral range, is around 20 gigahertz. <clears throat> so I introduce these scales because I want to mention for this workshop that this is a actually multi-scale problem. And the line width of every comb line is between one and 10 megahertz. So you can see the ratio is very high and ratio is exactly actually the, the finest. <clears throat> Dispersion is normal. Right, this geometry doesn't impact the material dispersion much. So essentially the material dispersion is what we are dealing with. And we walk between visible sort of and uh, three micron and uh, 1.5 micron. And uh, mostly it is a normal uh, dispersion. But because nonlinearity is chi two, not chi three, the solitons and the uh, modulation stability are, are not affected. They are affected, but they are present for both normal and anomalous dispersion. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so now is our theory formulation. We take Maxwell equations. These are Maxwell equations in uh, tensorial notations. There is a, a linear part of uh, interaction with the material, and there is a nonlinear part, right? Nonlinear part, as I said, is a quadratic nonlinearity. You can see the product of, of two fields, and we expand. Uh, this uh, electric field into the set of modes, right? Into two sets around, uh, uh, say, uh, omega p and around two omega p, right? And this is not an approximation. This actually modes of the resonator, <laughs> right? So our model expansion for a solution of Maxwell equation is actually reflects uh, completely the model structure. So this uh, mu whatever number is relevant for us between uh, 500 up to 10,000 modes uh, we are considering in this, uh, in this simulation. So that's properly reflect boundary conditions, actually no three dimensions through the, this is a transverse function going through the cross section of our resonator and theta is, a, is an angle uh, around the circumference. Okay, and this is a couple of mode equations we derive for modes A and B, A is around two omega pump, B is around two omega pump. So these are the units <clears throat> from the pump frequencies of the of individual modes. This is loss parameter, right? And then we can add a monochromatic pump into any mode we wish in, in this set. And here, this is a chronic symbol. We pump one of the modes in the B field. So this is, parametric down conversion or half frequency generation. If we plug, move the pump term here, which we do, right? Uh, then we have a second harmonic generation arrangement, right? So these terms correspond to the uh, frequency difference. And these terms, as you can see, correspond to the sum frequency and the particular the generate sum frequency will be your second harmonic, second harmonic generation. <clears throat> Then dispersion is very important, and that's how the sort of multi scales uh, become uh, the importance become becomes visible through analysis of the dispersion. Right, the eigenfrequencies of this resonator in the linear regime are approximated uh, by the following Taylor expansion. So mu is the relative mode number, omega zero is your central frequency. 
right? So these are units of frequency. Mu is just integer. So these parameters D, which are dispersion parameters, you can carry on to the mu cube, have D3, mu4, right? <clears throat> this is second order dispersion. And this is the first order dispersion. And first order dispersion is actually corresponds to the pulse repetition rate. This is in a way the group uh, group velocity group velocity term, and this is group velocity dispersion term. But these constants have units of frequency, right? And this d two a right is order of uh, sort of uh, probably megahertz, right? And then d one, as I told you, is twenty twenty gigahertz, right? So there is a very large difference between these two. But what is more important? Is because you can go into some rotating frame. What is more, you can eliminate this D1A. And then what is left is the difference between D1A and D1B. But this difference is still very large. This difference is order of one gigahertz, right? Or two gigahertz, as this one is megahertz. So the three orders of magnitude difference between these two uh, frequency scales, uh, and this is a kind of impacts uh, dynamics very heavily. And of course, then uh, matching between the modes uh, are very important, right? The frequency matching or phase matching is very important. <clears throat> and how this frequency or phase mismatch parameter is expressed here, right? If you, if you double your pump frequency, right? And if you come exactly at the central frequency in your B field, then you're exactly matched, right? But it never happens, right? If you because there is a dispersion, the spectrum is not equidistant because of this term, right? And this non-equidistance is uh, appreciable. This never happens, <clears throat> okay? And therefore, we can define this uh, phase velocity mismatch parameter or frequency mismatch parameter, which in terms of the refractive indices is expressed as the difference of the inverses of the refractive indices at this frequency and at this frequency. And if somehow you can match it, then you have zero, right? But typically here we work with the differences between zero and plus minus 20 gigahertz, right? Which is quite a lot. And uh, the second scale, as I said, is the difference between the, between the group velocities, so repetition rates of the pulses, and this is one gigahertz. So there can be various situations here, right? This can be much less than this, and we have very little control over this, right? Basically, basically in this system, we, we stuck with this number, and this we can control with the design of the resonator. <clears throat> or this one can be comparable to this, or this can be much larger than this. Okay. So now let's have a look at how complexity is sort of and uh, multi mode regimes emerge here. You take a CW state, constant solution, monochromatic, one mode in green field, one mode in red field, and you linearize your system. And when you do the linearization, you end up with a four by four matrix. So it means two side bands, symmetric side bands in the A field, coupled to two symmetric side bands in the B field. Okay. <clears throat> and this difference of scales it sort of can be mapped onto the different terms in this four by four matrix. So these two terms, the in blue circles, are so-called parametric terms. You can see the sign, they provide the coupling from A mu side band to A minus mu side band. And the sign here is plus and here is minus. So when you linearize and you, you look at this, they give you gain. This is so-called parametric gain. Right, and there are these uh, uh, rosy terms. There are four of them. They couple, they provide coupling between, from A side band to B side band with the same uh, mod number, relative mod number. And you can see that signs here are the same. He's minus, he's minus, plus, plus. So they don't give you any gain, right? Because of this is just like a couple of oscillators terms. If you actually look at this block, this is just like two couple to oscillators. Okay, no gain in the system, just transfer of energy through the coupling. And all of them have the same units, right? And 
there can be situations when these terms are comparable to these ones. There can be situations when these terms are much larger than these ones, and can be when these are much larger than these ones. And uh, this resonators behave in a quite different way. These three types of systems. So uh, first is parametric conversion, right? Parametric is when the blue terms are dominant. Or in fact, blue terms, when the blue terms are comparable to the pink ones, the system is parametric as well, because parametric is gain. So exponential gain sort of kills this coupling very, very efficiently. <clears throat> so this is parametric process when you have a one photon at a sort of two omega pump, right? And then it breaks down in two side bands in the, in the red field. This is your photon pair creation, right? Similar to four wave mixing, degenerate modulation stability in four wave mixing, very similar. The, <clears throat> when some frequency process uh, is dominant, then your resonator operation uh, dominates, uh, is dominated by the following uh, some frequency arrangements. So you take one pump photon and you take one sideband photon in the pump field, you add them up and you have uh, one photon in the sideband in the green field. Right, so this plus this gives you this, and then there's uh, coupling pink terms, uh, which are similar to the what is called in the uh, atom light interaction the Rabi flops. They drive the gain free uh, energy transfer between these two side bands, right? <clears throat> and this process become efficient when the following parameter epsilon mu, which is kind of phase matching parameter becomes close to zero and it's a combination of uh, phase velocity mismatch and group velocity mismatch uh, parameters right so <clears throat> yes in the in the parametric resonator so we have this group velocity mismatch is much uh, larger than the phase mismatch and if you look at the uh, a naught and B naught fields. Uh, so they, uh, if they scaled with gamma, they're uh, sort of uh, comparable to each other, right? And we have uh, we have this photon pair generation, right? And this A and B terms are basically pink and uh, uh, um, pink and blue terms in the mi matrix. So they're comparable. So this is the case when matrix is well balanced. And when we deal with the Rabi resonator. Right, we have a group velocity uh, mismatch term order of the phase velocity mismatch. And you can see that in this case, uh, the pink terms, right, are order of gigahertz, and the blue terms are order of, uh, order of megahertz. So this, uh, some frequency processes, Rabi flops are dominant. So matrix is off balance. You can develop the perturbation theory, right, for this matrix. Yeah. Yep. We are talking about uh, two different uh, devices, effectively, two different devices. Yes, it can happen within sort of the same device. If you if you change the pump, right, you can go from one situation to another situation. But we are talking about one setup here and another setup here. Okay, and this is the case that shows this um, uh, Rabi resonator. So this is a mode dynamics. You can see the very slow parametric gain and uh, a lot of Rabi oscillations, right? On top of this slow parametric gain. If I zoom, you can see that this is a perfect antiphase oscillations, right? <clears throat> and then we, uh, we, build, um, we build a bifurcation diagram, right? For, for, for these devices. So here we use the uh, intra-resonator uh, pump power, right? And here we use the detuning. So you can scan the laser frequency across the resonance. And this is detuning uh, from one of the resonances. And this is basically the instability domains built from this four by four matrix for each pair of modes. Here you can see six. So it means that mu plus minus six becomes unstable. Here you can see 29, 31 is actually here, they're coming down. Here they're sort of different uh, mod numbers cut across, right? And there are follow 
uh, energies are quite well separated. You can distinguish generation into a particular mod pair. But as you increase the power, these tanks of instability for given mod numbers start overlapping. And that's where you have the turbulent regimes. And here you can <coughs> see the dynamics that happen sort of close to threshold, right? Uh, inside, for example, this sin tank, right? You can see generation of, uh, of just a couple of sidebands, right? Here, two more sidebands, right? But as you move onto this side, you can see uh, this spectra. This spectra can be either fully incoherent, like for example, this one, this is actually a type of a breather, right? <coughs> that that is generated here. And this theory maps very well onto the experimental measurements, right? Which you can see on this, uh, on this slide, you can see uh, this spectra, right? Uh, which experimentally measured for both red and green fields. And here, how we reproduce them uh, numerically. So everything is matched, powers and the separation of spectral lines. And <clears throat> what are these regimes? regimes corresponding to it is that uh, this is type of curing pattern excited inside the uh, so I can go back okay this is a type of a Turing pattern regular periodic modulation right uh, inside your resonator but still nonlinear right because it's sort of you have you have this uh, side bands uh, generated. <clears throat> So now let's have a look what's going in parametric resonator. So parametric resonator, when you have a, when you bring it to the phase matching, right? You have the uh, parametric gain large. So bringing to phase matching means that this epsilon parameter, right? Is much smaller than the group velocity difference, which stays one gigahertz. And this becomes less, right? Close to zero. In this case, <coughs> right? Sort of the laminar flow is your no OP your state when you have a monochromatic field or the generate when you have a monochromatic in both green and red fields. And then what is interesting practically is this non degenerate OP your states, right? When you pump uh, here with the green light and you have this uh, photon pairs generated plus minus mu, and somehow you can control separation here. So you can control the uh, signal uh, and idler frequencies in your in your devices, right? <clears throat> you can in this regime you can simplify uh, a little bit uh, a little bit the coupled mode equations uh, because you can uh, work out the terms that oscillate with these fast frequencies. So you can eliminate the fast dynamics, keep only the slow dynamics, and then you have one central sideband left in the B field, right? Which couples to various sidebands in the A field. And you can make quite an analytic progress uh, with the system, right? Which um, gives you a very nice understanding of what is going on. So you can find this type of solutions when you have a single mode in B and different all the modes all the mode pairs that you wish in the A field. So you can see that this is type of roll pattern, right? <clears throat> and this is just a CW. And actually uh, you can study the stability of the roll pattern, complete stability. You can study the stability of a roll pattern with respect to excitation of a neighboring roll patterns. And that's what you typically find, right? You find the ladder of these instabilities. <clears throat> you start from the no sideband case, right? This is a mod number. And here I che I'm changing the tuning. So the power is kept fixed. The laser frequency is, is changing gradually, which is the easiest experimentally, right? Then you have generation of plus minus pairs, uh, plus minus one. Then plus minus one state changes to plus minus two, plus minus three and so on. And this are just different uh, parameters in particular different phase matching parameter. So, and, and then you, you have nothing, right? So at some point you reach the maximal possible number for a given power, right? And um, here you can see the comparison of numerics with analytics. So the circles are numerical solutions of the full coupled mode system and the red lines are 
solutions from the uh, from the from the reduced system. Okay, if you increase the power, you can go to very large uh, detunings from the pump frequency, which is uh, actually the desirable regime. You can see this ladder of instabilities uh, is going to much higher values of of mu here. Powers here are very low. Right? <clears throat> Our systems are very energy efficient. And this is basically the tuning of these devices, the tuning of frequency in these devices is driven by the house instability, which is well known from, uh, from fluid dynamics. <clears throat> but here we have a discrete version of this instability, right? Because the spectrum is very discrete, right? So we have a ladder-like sequence of the, of the house instabilities. Okay. <clears throat> So as we were able to see in this picture, of course, I have much less time, but this is not a problem. Uh, so we, we either have this uh, sort of pairs of mods generated, or we have a more complex combs appearing here with more mods involved here and here. It's interesting to look at the structure of these combs. Some of them have a staggered structure. So I'm switching sometimes from blue to green, right? So some of them have a staggered structure. You have comb lines in the red field, right? And when you have no comb line, the comb line appears actually in the blue field, okay? So this we call staggered combs. And these are non-staggered combs when every line in one field corresponds to the every line in another field. You can find them in the experiments as well. Here you can see experimental data, <coughs> red and blue spectra. And you can see where there is a comb line in the red, there is no comb line in blue, right? And when there is a comb line in blue, there is no line in red. Okay, <clears throat> now chi to solitons. So yes, you can have a multi-mode mod log states, right, corresponding to the regular trains of pulses in these uh, systems. And what is interesting about the systems, right? Uh, uh, despite that they are chi two systems, they sort of provide you a mix of more of, of regimes more similar to the kernel linearity, right? And the regimes which are pure chi two. This is because if you work out effective uh, nonlinear shifts of the modes, right? Uh, then these nonlinear shifts can be translated onto the refractive index. And the refractive index is a, a square root of uh, our phase matching involving group velocity and uh, phase velocity mismatches and nonlinear terms, right? And if you expand the square root in case when you're phase matched, right, you will find that the shift of the resonance, your effective nonlinearity is actually proportional to the amplitude of the field. This is so-called Pockels effect, or in fact, this is a chi nonlinearity as it is. In case uh, when uh, you are badly mismatched, this parameter is very large, you expand the square root, right? You have a second power of the modules of the pump, right? This is effective kernel linearity. So in this regime, your system operates uh, and uh, is going to produce care-like solitons. And you can find the solitons in both situations, right? And you can see here, you can have a turbulent regimes, right? And then you have a suddenly uh, mod locking state. You can see the transition here, which is very nice. And what is generated here is very nice train of pulses, <clears throat> right? Solitons. And here you have this house instability, which is uh, as well practically useful when you can tune right the frequency of the of the signal. If you zoom onto the spectrum of the solitons, they're sort of interesting, right? You can see the red spectrum, and you can see the green spectrum, and you can see that green spectrum is very different on the tails and in the middle, right? And if you walk through this. Uh, Phase matching condition and effective refractive index, you can find that this part of the spectrum, which is stronger than the tail, the central part, is actually driven by the second order pockets like nonlinearity, while the tails, straight tails, are driven by the effective care effect, effective four wave mixing in this system. 
So this is a combination of the pockets and care effects. And if you generate the uh, non-solitonic spectra, you can see immediate difference between this incoherent spectra and this well-organized coherent spectra. So you can move, you can change your resonator and move this part. If you don't like the, this hump in the middle, spectral hump, you can move it onto the tail, right? And then you can have solitons like this. You can see they're nice and smooth in the middle, and you move this pockets effect away to the tails. And in this case, these pulses in time domain look like that. Okay, <clears throat> you can find some analytic solutions in the simpler cases when both of these parameters are close to zero, right? So everything is matched, everything is second order, pockets nonlinearity, and then you can find a soliton approximated by CH squared, right? Which is unlike the CH to the power one in case when you have a care or effective care nonlinearity as I described to you. And this is my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for one, two questions. Can probably start with a question on we got online. Is it the absolute the absolute temperature that is hazardous for micro micro ring functionality, or is it the relative changes in temperature during active operation the, uh, of the optical link? Temperature so, temperature can be assumed stabilized. Okay. okay. Any any questions? Yeah. Um, can you please explain why the, uh, the difference between the two solids, like one has tails and the other one not? One has tails and the other one not. They all have tails, right? No, no, the, the other slide. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the red and green ones, the both You mean this tail? Yes, exactly. Well, this one has a tail as well. Ah, it has. Okay. Of course, it has a tail, right? But you, you mean oscillation? What so do you mean? This means that uh, they are completely to the other sources, right? They are clinic to the periodic orbit. Yeah. They, are, they, they come to the periodic orbit. In this system, this is a finite size system. So between the, the finite size. Is it, uh, space doesn't go to infinity. You cannot have exact homoclinic orbit in the real physical device. How do you explain the, the, the energy of the the energy is not infinite. This is the full size of my device. This is a physical space. My device starts here, minus pi, ends here, plus pi. It's a ring. It's a ring. It's a full size system. As I told you, my modes reflect the real device, not approximation. Any more questions? Just got a quick curiosity. When you start, when you derive your system from the Maxwell equations, you have this uh, no local, uh, no locality in time. How how do you deal with that? Do you make any assumption about the no locality in time? Is uh, it's a... is dispersion? As there is no assumption about it. All ah, right. A so it's a, it's a dispersion term. It's uh, you know in Fourier domain. It's just a uh, it just uh, it just omega mu. My, okay, my, so my frequencies. I know spectrum of my system exactly, right? I can solve linear Maxwell equations. Okay. You know, exactly with uh, whatever uh, computational tool which is available now. So I know the spectrum, exact spectrum, basically linear okay. spectrum. Okay. So you treat it in full generality. Of course. Of course. Okay. All right. Karim. The spectra mm -hmm. in the right corner, the okay. two pictures, okay. kind of from from the practical purpose. Why the bottom one is better than say the top? No, it's not. No, 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 it's not. Kind of you what know, are you after? In, what from, are you from, trying from application from yeah. uh, practical uh, applications? Right. <laughs> this is a turbulent workshop, right? <laughs> so somehow turbulence is important. Turbulence is not very important. For applications of micro resonators, 
This regime is much better than the turbulence. It gives you low noise, right? Uh, predictable sideband generation that you can control. So right? you are trying to generate this, yeah? The spectrum, the left. I'm interested in everything, but from point of view, practical applications, this is much better. Or, right, these regimes, the same, like very good. This one you want. Uh, or these solitons, that's what you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, right? thank all, you. All these mod log states, mm -hmm. that's what you want. Yes. Just, Dima, it's not turbulent workshop, it was just my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in, in practical terms, because it is about application, so Kai 2 often uh, sort of is preferable because it is higher power, right, available. So in terms of applications, so what would be main advantage of Chi-2 uh, microresonators compared to standard one considered by people? Is it power or is it frequency also? Other bands mm -hmm. or both? Or? Well, well, you don't want sort of to neglect any potential advantages uh, uh, from this list, right? But the first one is obviously the most important, right? The first one is, is that you, with Chi 2 you have octate, right? If you have Chi 2 available, you know, design, then you have octate. And this is very important to have octate, right, for cell preferences. Okay, you can have two narrow spectra, you don't need to fill in between, but you already can cell preference. This is the main advantage, right? The second one is independence uh, of the solitons and um, during pattern generation of the dispersion, right? Because with Chi 3, always there is a constraint on anomalous dispersion. And here you can work with normal. And normal is available in the visible, right? Uh, which is which is very good advantage. And this um, the fact that Chi 2 is much stronger, I, I, I don't think it's a very big advantage because Chi 2 is much stronger, but only in the narrow band. You need to be near phase matching. So the strength comes at the cost of a narrow uh, spectral boundary. Okay, thanks very much. So we have a coffee break now. We will uh, resume at 11.55. Mark confirms we can shift the launch break a little bit. Take it later. Thank you. 